the second line. Good morning, everybody. How did this get too tall for me? Who's taller than me? Thanks for coming. It's great to see everybody this morning. Let's go ahead and stand up and let's sing together. Let the glory of the Lord Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Father, we come to you today just to honor you, Father. You are the great I am, and we just love you and we praise you, Father. 
I want to ask for traveling grace for our pastor mm. and his wife. Give them a time of relaxation and peace so they can come back to us refreshed, Father. Grant them a safe journey, Father. And we also want to thank Ken Harmon for being here with us today. I just want to praise you for the work you did with my oral surgery. You gave me such great peace and comfort and for the work that you're doing in my granddaughter. Father, I thank you. Thank you for your son that died on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome out there online. Uh, as all of you know, Mike and Sherry are on vacation. They're up in Colorado right now. They'll be on their way home probably this next week. Uh, so filling in for Mike today, uh, our guest speaker is Ken Harmon and his wife, Dandy, Dandy, excuse me. And uh, all of you know him, I'm pretty well sure. So we just uh, welcome you, Ken. For, Thanks. And, uh, look forward to your message of today. So we'll just continue to sing. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, Buck. We appreciate having Ken here, and uh, gonna sing a couple of my old favorites. It seems like we always sing my old favorites because I get to pick the songs. But uh, this is—I uh, love the words to this song. How? Oh, what peace we often forfeit! Oh, what needless pain we bear! all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Doesn't that just really hit you where it hurts? You know? Just keep in mind who's on your side as we sing this this morning. If you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, however you want to worship this morning, let's just sing together and praise God. What a friend we have in Jesus. Our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, Trials and temptations Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged Take it to the Lord in prayer Can we find a friend so famous? knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? But with the load of care, precious Savior still our rest. Despise, forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee, and will find a solace there. Because you were forsaken, 
I'm accepted You were condemned I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again I'm forgiven Because you were forsaken Accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be? You, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you. Amazing love. die for me amazing love I know it's true it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you I'm forgiven you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love die for me amazing love I know it's true and it's my joy to honor you amazing love how can it be died for me amazing love I know it's true and it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you you
amazing love I know it's true and it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you in all I do I honor you Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet
Father, thank you for this reminder that you never will fail us. You never will fail. Thank you that you are our friend and on our side and all the things you've done for us. We ask that your presence be in this place, whether we're here together online or whether we're here together in person, that you be present with each and every person joining us today. We just ask your blessing and, and your peace in these in these troubled times. In your name we pray. Amen. There's clearance. I don't think it was going to crowd me. Good morning. It is great to be with you this morning. It's been a little while. And so it's good to be back. It always, you know, it feels always like a kind of a homecoming whenever I come back. And so so it is good to be with you this morning. Um, let me just start by saying thank you for being a, a part of our ministry team, for supporting Northwest Collegiate Ministries. Some of you may or may not know that Hall Boulevard is one of our supporters through the association for the work that we do on the college and university campuses. And, uh, you know, it's exciting to meet Isaac and visit with him a little bit because Isaac's a part of our ministry at Portland State University with Miriam and working down there with our campus missionary that's there. It is a great time to be a follower of Jesus. And it is a great time to be doing ministry on the college and university campuses. Now, we have, I don't know if you all know this, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, it's been really challenging on college and university campuses for about the last year and a half. A lot of our colleges and universities have had no campus classes on campus. Everything has been online. Now, when you're doing a ministry that is based on the campus, where the students are supposed to be, and they're not there, it changes the face of your ministry. But I want you to know that we have a great staff of campus missionaries that are working on different campuses here in the Northwest that in spite of not being able to meet on campus, they are actively engaging college and university students wherever they are. And so we have staff that are discipling students in New York, in California, in New Mexico, in Texas, from here. And every week they've been meeting faithfully for the last year and a half with those students. Online, through Zoom. I think everybody's a little Zoomed out by now. But you know, it's been pretty amazing to realize that we can engage and meet with students literally from all over the world because some of our campus ministers have been meeting with students in the Middle East, in China, in other parts of the world through Zoom on a weekly basis, discipling them, sharing the gospel with them, and we're seeing the Lord move in the lives of students, not just here in the Northwest, but all over the United States because the students that would normally be here from all over the United States and the world, they're not here right now. Now, we're praying because Classes are starting soon, and so I'm going to ask you to pray with us that students will be able to return to the campus this fall. I mean, we're planning on it. The universities are planning on it. I don't know what normal is going to be in the future. I don't know what normal is going to look like on campuses, but what I do know is that we have a God that loves college and university students, and He is working to see them come back to him and to know him 
And so pray for our campus missionaries, pray for our NCM staff and those who are sharing the gospel on the campus because they're going to be there. We're going to be there discipling and mobilizing and challenging students to grow in their faith, to know the God that loves them, that died for them. And so thank you for continuing to partner and minister with us because the truth is we're ministering there because you're enabling us to minister there. You're a part of that team. And so you need to know that what we're doing, you're doing with us. And you're a part of that. So thank you. This morning, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. Your electronic devices, you can turn them on. Go to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 18 through 39. So I'm going to give you a moment to go there. I don't know about you, but I'm sure that many of you, like me, we're tired of masks. We're tired of pandemics. We're tired of fires and smoke. We're tired of just not knowing what we can and can't do. We're tired of leadership leading this way or leadership leading that way in our governments. We can kind of get to this place of just being tired, of being weary, maybe disgruntled even. But today I want to bring you a message of hope, really a message to remind you of what God is doing and that we have a God that has not changed. He is still the same in the midst of a pandemic. He is still doing what he has always done. Working toward the redemption of all of mankind. And to remind you that you have every reason to be hopeful today. That you don't need to be sad. You don't need to be hopeless. But more than ever, through faith, filled with hope. And so if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Romans chapter 8, begin with verse 18. And it says this, let me read it. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Now that in itself is enough, isn't it? Isn't that a good word of encouragement? Because how many feel you like we're suffering a little bit right now? Now, maybe compared to the rest of the world, we're not suffering that much. But compared to what we're used to, this has been a challenging time. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's Son to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, no, not only that but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good, for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the first fruits among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified. 
and those he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more, he, was, he has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor, angel, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the encouragement that we draw from you the encouragement that we draw from your words that give us life because of your spirit lord i pray that you would bring these words to life in our lives today and that we would leave here encouraged by the hope that we have in you a hope that does not fade away but a hope that endures until that day when what we hope for will be seen. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, hope. Hope when we look around and so many things seem hopeless. We look around and we see anger. We see disappointment. We see fear. We see death. We see suffering. We see all of the things of this world. And we live in a time when, when we can turn on our TVs or we can turn on our computers and everything in this world is right before our eyes in a moment. And it's pretty amazing because whenever we read the news and we see the news, how often is it positive and encouraging? Never. Never. I was a public relations major in college many, many years ago. And when you're a public relations major, that means that you take a lot of journalism and writing classes. And it's kind of a funny thing because I really hate to write. I really should do more of it, but I don't like it that much. But what I learned in journalism is that if it bleeds, it leads. People want to read the things that aren't always positive. They want to see the things that excite them, but not always in a wholesome way. And so, if there's pain and suffering, that's going to be the headline. And we miss the story. We miss what's really happening. And we can get wrapped up in the headlines. And we can become afraid. And we can become fearful. Instead of seeing the whole story and seeing that we're a part of the story of God that's being unveiled through history. That is unfolding day by day in this world. And if you read the headlines, you have every reason to go, it's all coming apart. The world as we know it is going to hell in a handbasket. And I think there's a part of me that becomes very sad because I think as I have opportunity to observe the Christians and hear and see and, and hear from, that they look at it and they begin to feel the same way. 
And I want to say to you, follower of Jesus, these are not desperate times. These are not hopeless times. These are not days of destruction for us. Because we have a God that has overcome. And so we must be reminded, first, that hope is seeking a future that we cannot see. That's what hope is. Verse 24 says, for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Patiently, with confidence, being sure. Being sure that this is not the end of our story. That whatever comes, whatever happens, we don't have to be fearful in that. We're looking for a better day when God's kingdom will come. Do you believe God's kingdom will come? We believe in that, don't we? And so if we believe in that, then it's time for us to begin to live like that. That we believe that it will happen. Think on this for a moment. No more suffering. No more pandemics. No more pain. No more masks. No more death. No more racism or inequality. No more disasters. No more hate. No more hunger, no more fear, no more smoke, no more ice storms, no more. And you may wonder why the world thinks we're crazy. Because we believe in a day when there will be no more of those things. We hope for something that mankind, in all of his effort, in all that we attempt, we believe in something that mankind has never been able to provide. Just imagine a world without all of that. All of that that brings harm to the creation that God has made. As man, we have tried very hard to make our own way. To fix the problems that can only be fixed by God. Right? And so, the second thing. Hope is certain that God is working in our behalf. Verse 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we know. That's how that verse starts out. And we know. It is so real that we can see it. Is it so real in your life? What you know, what you're hoping for, is it so real that you can already see it? Because you see, that's, that's what faith and hope do in our lives. It gives us a confidence that is unwavering. It says, I know this is going to happen. This is what God is doing, and this is what God will accomplish. It's the confidence that flows, honestly, from experience. That give those who don't have the experience confidence. This is where I would say to our wonderful senior adults, we need you to remind us and to remind those who are younger to remind them often the story of God's faithfulness. The stories of how God has provided. Got stuck. Sorry, I got to have him to read. I don't know what happened. But it's important for you who have lived life 
to come alongside those who are younger, who have not had the life experiences and say, hang on, don't give up. Let me tell you about God's faithfulness and how God has provided in every circumstance in my life and our lives and through the journey. And he is good all the time. Even when life gets hard. You see, senior adults, you bring to the table life experience. You bring to the table a walk that has history. That says, I can tell you of God's faithfulness through many circumstances. I love to have the opportunity to do marriage counseling with young adults. You know, that, that stuff to prep them for a long life of marriage together. And to say, you know what you really need to do? You need to find someone who's been married a long time. And you just, you just need to sit down and have lunch with them. And you need to just listen. Don't talk. Listen. Listen to the stories of difficulty and challenge. Stories of maybe when they didn't know how they were going to pay their bills. But somewhere and somehow God provided. They didn't know how they were going to take care of something in their life, a tragedy, and how they were going to get through. But somehow, through God's faithfulness, they made it through. And now, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years later, they continue to see God's faithfulness in their relationship. Because they hold on to a hope. That God will finish what he started. Not just in them individually, but them as a couple. And not just as them as a couple, but them in the body of the church. That God will finish what he has started. And so we need you to remind us that God is working in our behalf. In all things. Do you believe that in all things that God is working in your behalf? Do you believe in all things that God is working for your good? How about that? That God, the, the creator of the universe is working for your good. In the midst of social unrest, political unrest, environmental unrest, financial unrest, emotional unrest, relational unrest, and we can keep going. God is working for your good. For our good. He is not working for our ease and comfort. So please don't be confused. I think sometimes we evaluate, is God working for my good based on how comfortable I am? Or how easy life is? And when life becomes just a little bit uncomfortable, or a little bit difficult, we, where, where are you, God? Where are you? Because we become confused about what God is working for in our lives. He is working for our good. And so don't confuse the two. And if you don't believe me, just read a little bit of scripture. I think you will find those who followed God, who followed Jesus with all of their lives, comfort was not really a part of the definition of what it meant to follow Jesus. Ease was not a part of the definition of what it meant to follow Jesus. But to follow, there was a confidence that God was always working for my good. That he was working through every circumstance. You see, God may not change our situation. He may not change your circumstance, but he is changing you. He's changing you. He's changing me. He's working in our behalf in ways that we can't see or comprehend. But by faith, we believe. We hope for better without becoming despondent, discouraged, or afraid due to our circumstances. You see, what hope does is hope raises you up above your circumstances. That's what hope does. 
It says, instead of getting mired in the midst of the difficulty and the challenge and all that's going on, the mess. Anybody have mess in their lives or around their lives? It's kind of, you know, that thing that mess just seems to follow us. Now, I can give you the reason for that. We call it sin. We live in a fallen, broken world. And because we live in a fallen, broken world, that means that we will spend our days in mess. But do you know we can spend our days in mess for the glory of God? That God has put us in the mess that we're in, not so that we will be in mess, but so that we can give Him glory. And so that we can share the hope that we have with others. And so he's not removed us. He's not isolated us from the difficulties of the time. Now, if you've been watching the news, you may know there's been a hurricane recently. Pretty devastating. I have a good friend. A good friend. That two trees fell through the middle of his house. And it's not livable. Now, his family had evacuated. He was still there. Why? I don't know why. I asked him, why are you still there? But he was still there. And by God's grace, delivered. But you see, just because you love Jesus doesn't mean that the effects of the storm won't touch your life. If you think that the effects of the storm won't touch your life, then when the storm comes and your life is impacted, you will ask the question, God, where are you? What, what happened? Are you real? Do you exist? Maybe, maybe, I, maybe God's just not real. But it's because we have a poor understanding of how we perceive that we're going to live in this time and this place. You see, we're not called out of the mess. We're called into the mess. We're called into the mess that we can rescue those who are perishing. That we can engage with those who are suffering that have difficulty in life. But here's what I know. We live in a difficult time, difficult situation. And if our sight is on us, and our hope is in our government, or our job, or science, or ourselves, it's a tough place to be. But do you recognize how nervous everyone must be who has placed their hope in those things, those things that are temporary? With all of the things that are going on, that through our strength and our power and our science and our abilities, We've not been able to fix. Worlds are shaken. But there's nothing that can shake our world. There's nothing that can destroy our home when it's not found here. You know, fires and floods, they can take our homes here. But we have a home in heaven that can never be taken. We are temporary residents in this place. If you're tired of being afraid of the present and the future, Jesus gives us hope. Jesus gives us hope for the only better that there can be. And it's eternal. Third thing, hope is trusting in the power of God. Verse 31 says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. If God is for us, if God is for you, who can be against you? Now understand that this is a picture of you and me being on God's team. Not God being on my team. You know, you might remember back to playing in elementary school on the playground and picking teams. 
you know. Now imagine you're the team captain and you get to pick teams and God is on one of those lineups that you get to pick. Who's going to get picked first? God, right? I mean, hello, who's going to ever be God? Anything? So you always pick God to be on your team first. But you see, that's not the way it works. You're not picking God to be on your team. God has picked you, who quite honestly may deserve to get picked last. God has picked you to be on his team. God has chosen you to be on his team. Now, whose team do you want to be on? God's team or somebody else's? I'd rather be on God's team. Because we already know before the game ever starts, who's going to win. Because God's team doesn't lose. God's team doesn't lose. And so, so you got to see that if you're on my team, you're in trouble. If I'm the leader of the team, you're in trouble. If I'm the one that has the plan, you're in trouble. But if it's God's team and God's plan, then we can have confidence. Because it's his power. You see, God is the owner, the player, the coach, the commissioner, the manager. He's the agent. He's all of those things. And he's picked us to be on his team. We don't need to worry about whether or not we will win. We've already won. But we do need to focus on how we play. We need to focus on how we play. We need to practice and prepare. We can get into the game and play half-hearted. Or we can play with all that we are. Fully engaged. And I think... Followers of Jesus, sometimes we play half-hearted. And it's time for us to be fully invested. To realize that our hope is in the power of God, not our own strength, not our own power. And because of that, we can go full on. It's not an excuse to say, well, then God's got it. I don't have to do anything. No, no. God's invited us in. He has chosen us to be a part of his team, to be a player, a part of his plan. God has a purpose for your life. We're never at a point that we're beyond or before God's plan. God has a plan for your life right now where you are. Are you a part of that plan? He has given us a spirit that dwells in us. It says that when we don't know the words to pray, he intercedes for us. He gives us the words to pray. Verse 32 and 33 and 34 says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? We have every reason to be hopeful. You see, because we have a spirit that dwells in us, that gives us directions, that gives us the very words to pray when we don't know what to pray every day. We have Jesus who intercedes for us, who's at the right hand of the Father, who's purchased us, who represents us, who defends us, who makes his case for us by his blood. And we have a Father who's working for our good every day. Every day. Paul goes on to say in verse 36, 37, 38, As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to the slaughter. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. It doesn't say it's going to be easy all day long. 
We face difficulty all day long. We're considered as sheep to the slaughter. Sheep to be killed. But then verse 37 says, But no, please understand, even though that is true, understand in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do you see the contrast in this? We are sheep for the slaughter. We are sheep to be killed. How threatening is a sheep? Not very. You know, you don't look at a sheep and go, oh my. Does it bite? Right? We don't worry about the sheep. Because the sheep are meek and gentle. But he says, understand that's a truth. But don't miss this. You are more than conquerors. You are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Sheep, more than conquerors. Sheep, more than conquerors. Isn't that interesting? And finally, for I am convinced, verse 38, highlight this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's right. That's a woohoo moment right there. Nothing. So what can separate you from God? Nothing. How powerful is God? All powerful. What can separate you? Nothing. Nothing in this world. If you want to know hope today, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And if you've lost hope today, his name is Jesus that will restore your hope. That will renew and refresh your hope. So that when you see the world and when you watch the news. Let me just say, if it becomes overwhelming, there's a button on your remote called off. Just push it. It's amazing. Just like that, it just goes away. It just goes away. And you can open this book and be reminded... That you have an all-powerful God who gives you all hope. Because you are more than conquerors. You have been chosen. Wherever you've been. Whatever you've done. Whatever fears maybe you've been holding on to. Whatever things that have been consuming you in this day. Maybe you're consumed by, should I get a vaccine? Should I not get a vaccine? I'm angry about people that get it. I'm angry about people who don't get it. Let me just say, Jesus is our focus. Jesus is our strength. Jesus is our power. Don't get distracted. In these days, it is too easy to become distracted by the things of our world that want to just consume us. You could spend hours just watching the news. And you get news all over the world. News from Afghanistan. Continue to pray for the believers that are still there. Because let me just tell you, God is not done in in Afghanistan because we pulled out. 
And we may not like how we pulled out, and that's okay. But God is not done there. Because he is still working for the redemption of those he has created there. And so we pray. Because you know what? We have an enemy. We have an enemy. And it's not the Taliban. It's not the Muslims. It's not ISIS. It's not. Too often we get distracted and we get confused on who the enemy is. We have an enemy who is working hard to kill, steal, and destroy those who God has created. And you look around and you say, who has God created? Oh, all of us! From every tribe and every language, God has created all of us and He desires that all of us would come to know Him. And so we pray... That the good news of Jesus would go out in every circumstance, in every situation. And to realize that it's not hopeless. Because sometimes we look at situations and go, that's just hopeless. It's never hopeless. Because with our God, there's nothing that is hopeless. He is our hope. To the day that we see hope become reality. Right? On that day, we will need to hope no longer. But until then, we shall hope. And I would say to you, do not give up on hope. Encourage one another. When you hear somebody saying, oh my. Say, no, 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 no. We have a God who gives us hope. Don't become distraught. Don't become overwhelmed. Because our God is greater. Our God is greater. And so just know, if you don't know Jesus today, it really is as simple as saying, Lord, I believe that you died for me. That I've been living a selfish, sinful life, and I am separated from you because of my sin. Because of the sin, the real pandemic is sin. It's not a virus. You need to understand that. The real pandemic is sin. And I've been overwhelmed by that. And the only hope that I have is Jesus. Forgive me. I believe that you died and you rose again. That You are the Son of God. The Bible says that when you confess, when you believe and confess, that you'll be saved. It's simple. And it's available to you today. And when you accept Jesus into your life, and if you already know him, you have every reason today to be filled with hope. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be here. Lord, to uh, worship you to sing your praises. Father, I pray that you would just remind us that in light of the days in which we live and the challenges that we face and the difficulties that day to day we're confronted by, that you are all powerful and you give us hope in the midst of hopelessness. Father, I pray today that if there's one that doesn't know you, That today they would confess before you their sin, their brokenness, their separation, their need for a Savior. And that they would ask you to forgive them and to be their Lord. That they might invite you in because you've chosen them. You've chosen them to be on your team. Show them today how much you love them. Remind them how much you care. God, thank you for how you change us. Lord, encourage each one of our hearts today that we would step out of these doors with confidence. And every day that we go out, we walk in a place of confidence before you. Because word's clear, you go before us. 
You are in us. You are with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And so every day we have the power of the creator of the universe that dwells in us. So what shall we fear but nothing today? Because you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. dismissed. Remember we have refreshments in the fellowship hall. That's right. We have refreshments now in the fellowship hall. So make sure you grab a bite to eat and say hi and fellowship on your way out. Thanks for coming everybody.
paz oh, oh, oh let it rise oh, oh, oh let it rise let the glory of the Lord Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Bye. 